Welcome to OEC Health Talks. I'm Joe Naglowski, OEC's President and CEO. And we are excited for you to join us for this educational video series that dives deeper into specific health topics that we know are important to you and the OEC community. Today's OEC Health Talk tackles another important topic, robotic surgery, the future of obesity care, featuring bariatric surgeon, Dr. Walter Medlin. Living in an era of ongoing improvements in the science and technology is exciting, especially when we see advances like robotic surgery. In the OEC's upcoming health talk, Dr. Medlin will teach you about robotic surgery, if you should consider it for yourself, and what questions you should ask your surgeon before considering robotic surgery. And with that, take it away, Dr. Medlin. Hi, I'm Walt Medlin. I am a bariatric surgeon uh, and a robotic surgeon. I'm also a weight loss surgery patient and a, a proud uh, uh, former board member of Obesity Action Coalition and an ongoing uh, member. Um, and I, I love the mission. Um, and so this is an education part, but it's also a support part. I, in some ways, want to talk this morning more like if you're, if I was your cousin and uh, you called me on the phone to ask about, hey, what's this robotic stuff? So uh, I'm not going to be super academic. I'm not going to refer to um, a lot of literature today. I, I just want to sort of talk about uh, the robotic platform, and I'm going to talk most specifically to keep it focused on bariatric procedures. Um, but a lot of folks will uh, have the same robot question for other types of procedures. Um, and uh, um, I'll refer you a little bit to the article uh, that we wrote for the Your Weight Matters uh, magazine with my uh, former PA, uh, Michelle Everly, who's now in med school. Uh, uh, it's a good article, it's a little more complete than this. So um, I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and um, and uh, I just want to uh, give you the takeaway first, so you don't have to uh, go through my whole talk to get the takeaway. The first thing is, it never hurts to talk to two surgeons if you have big questions. Um, a little second opinion can go a long way, and that's going to be even more important, I think. Right now in the U.S., we have one robotic system that's uh, fully rolled down, and that's the intuitive platform, the DaVinci robot uh, for abdominal surgery. There's a few other things that are called robots for orthopedic procedures, but they're not, they're not used in the abdomen. Um, over the next decade, we're going to have several new robotic platforms arrived, and I think a second opinion on these type of things is never going to be wasted time, but it does take time to get a second opinion. I, I'm always amazed in the era of the Internet. People think they've done research and really what they've done is spent an hour or two clicking on some slides and some uh, websites. You need to go see a second surgeon if you really want a second opinion. And the surgeon who's going to actually take care of you is the only one who can really give a completely valid second opinion. Now, most people don't need that. Most people uh, are not, uh, they don't have these super special needs, but that is the first takeaway that the real person uh, who's most to benefit from digging in a little bit on the question of am I benefiting from the robot is if you really have special needs surgically. And, and for most people, that's going to be reoperative surgery or extremes of age or weight. Uh, people over four or 500 pounds may benefit more. People who've had um, uh, uh, complex other surgical procedures where they've already had part of their colon removed or an ostomy, they may benefit more uh, than others, or definitely maybe more consideration. Um, the real, the real honest answer for this, there's no blanket answer for robot better or worse, is what do your surgeons recommend? If they recommend no robot, then I would not use a robot. Um, uh, and if they um, are experienced with a robot, um, then they have the ability to really have every tool in their toolbox. So if they don't do robotics at all, then that's not as legitimate. Um, but if they do robotics and they say, no, we, we need to do your procedure laparoscopically, don't push for the robot. Um, what experience counts for in 2022 is at least 10 cases. Um, if somebody's doing their first cases and they're doing them proctored and they want you to be one of their first cases, that probably means you actually don't have special needs. You're probably a standard or fairly easy patient. I wouldn't go against having robotic procedure as a surgeon's uh, learning curve as long as they're doing it deliberately and they inform you. And most do. Most surgeons are very uh, uh, careful about letting patients know, um, you know where they fit in this. So I would also say, if you're going to do a second opinion and if you're going to go in with a list of questions, 
really try to focus on your two or three biggest questions, more than about five questions. It just, they end up being lower quality questions and you're not gonna get them answered well anyhow. You could lay out a list of questions, but honestly, most people, there's two or three big questions. So um, uh, don't feel like more is better in terms of the number um, of questions. And necessarily the number of procedures don't, don't think that if one partner's done 30 robotic procedures and another's done 300, that you're changing quality that much. Um, I really, I wanna give a shout out actually to young surgeons uh, and to female surgeons who tend to be younger just because uh, uh, surgery used to be a lot more discriminatory or um, less uh, diverse. And so um, young, young surgeons and female surgeons do an awesome job. They're very well trained. Um, it's nice if they have backup of older surgeons in their practice, um, but that's, that goes the same for older surgeons. It's nice if they have young surgeons and fresh blood in their practice, people are giving them a per fresh perspective. So you will find surgeons who choose to do the robotic uh, platform, to use this robotic platform, come from all different sorts of reasons. Some older surgeons do it because of uh, joint problems or um, it, it's easier on their body. Some young surgeons do it because it's a, the new technology and they were trained in it and they're very familiar with it. But most of us ultimately, all of us ultimately, it really comes down to, is it better for the patient? Uh, and if it's not better for the patient, we're gonna resist. And there are uh, definitely marketing benefits where hospitals want to sell this robotic platform as something amazing. It is amazing, but sometimes they oversell that. So just know you're gonna get some different messages. Uh, know that overall, this is a legitimate uh, way of doing things that is, I don't wanna say it's an improvement, but it's an enhancement. It's, a, it's an additional tool for our toolbox. So I'm gonna to show you here. So those are the basics. This is uh, Dr. Amarim, who's my buddy up in Pocatello, and he is an expert foregut surgeon and general surgeon. Uh, foregut is, is like anti-reflux operations and uh, cancers of the uh, stomach and esophagus. And I worked with him uh, up in Pocatello and, and we're still buddies. Uh, and he is sitting at the robotic console uh, about to, to interface uh, with the patient with the computer in the middle. So that's the takeaway here. This is a way to put a computer between the surgeon and the patient. And as long as the computer works well, which the current uh, systems work really well, they're really refined, it's awesome. 15, 20 years ago, that was not the case. The, robot, the computer was a little clunky and we didn't trust it. So um, I'm gonna show you another picture here. This is the console from the surgeon's view about to slide the chair in, where you can see there's some pedals for the feet, like a, like a church organ. There's a, this a little bar in front is a place where your arms, uh, your elbows sort of rest. Uh, so you're really just using your hands. You have a little less, uh, um, a little good support. And there's also a couple of pads in there that will help you uh, control, um, controller pads uh, to, to show um, how the arms are gonna move in response to your actions. Those little um, uh, figure eight Velcro things are where your fingers go and that, that's where you control the arm uh, movements of the robot. And then up at the top, you can see a little, uh, looks like a pair of eyeglasses. That's where you're looking into two different screens. So you have 3D, three-dimensional view. Um, this, is, uh, this is the surgeon interface. I'm gonna show you here. This is the patient side interface where you can see these small straight tools that look like laparoscopic tools. Robotic surgery currently is very similar to laparoscopy. We go through little ports, little incisions in the abdomen. We inflate the abdomen with carbon dioxide. Um, and, and basically those robot arms just replace our arms and they move as we direct them. It doesn't do anything independently. It's not an autonomous robot. Uh, it, is really, it is really just a, a, a computer controlled uh, instrument. Um, but it has four different arms and you can control all four of those arms from that surgeon console. Uh, normally in an OR, there are two people. Uh, one is controlling a camera and then another grasper and then the surgeon usually has two different instruments in their hand. Uh, I'm gonna show you the console, the suite here. So the first three are pictures that you see are the really instruments. The last two pictures are just different views of the, of the uh, uh, the patient side uh, instrument. So the first is that 
surgeon console. The second is the tower where everything plugs in uh, from the bedside, and it's got a little TV on top of it, and we usually have four or five monitors in the OR where everybody in the OR can see what's going on inside. And then you have this, this large um, patient side tower with articulating arms, uh, and we have to very carefully position that, obviously, over the patient, um, and we can angle it, we can move it, we can rotate it up and down, and that just shows it in different configurations. Um, the other uh, newer robots that are different uh, are going to have different looks. So some of them have several different little platforms around the patient. Uh, some of them have a little different console. They're made by different manufacturers, um, and um, I think they'll be adopted. I think they've, uh, they're, they're doing good research on all of these coming through. Uh, these are instruments. Now, you wouldn't really be able to tell that much of a difference between these instruments and the standard laparoscopic instrument, except they have a wrist. If you can see, they're angulated at the tip, not just open and closed. You can actually do this laparoscopically too. There are manufacturers that make wristed instruments, but they're complicated. Almost anything we can do on the robot, you can do without a robot, but the computer allows you to put several of these um, benefits together in one package. So the wristed instrument, the, um, the binocular vision that gives you a 3D view, the ability to do um, some enhancement of the image that we see, not quite Star Trek yet, but getting there in terms of being able to do overlay uh, um, or, or filter vision. Um, and then um, the ability to sit, uh, like I said, is something. For me, one of the biggest benefits of the robot is that I can control the camera. And this doesn't show the camera, but um, uh, so the camera, uh, movement is one aspect of fatigue. We have a human being holding a camera on a stick. There's always a little shake, and the robot does not shake. And um, it's not much shake, but on an image on the camera, it makes more of a difference than, uh, honestly, even if you're sewing, your little variation is not much. Um, but it does uh, soften that up as well. So um, again, I just want to come back to the takeaway. If we were on the phone and you called me up uh, as a relative, um, I will tell you, I do about half my cases robotically now. Um, a fair number of the cases I don't do robotically is at a surgery center where we don't have a robot. Um, there are a few cases I don't want to do robotically because of some other limitations with the feel that you don't really have with the, um, with the robot arms. Um, and then a fair amount of it is just availability. There is some cost, and so most hospitals have a limited number of robots. Um, and, and so sometimes a lot of patients, if I told them, oh, I can do your surgery, and, or my scheduler did. I don't tell anybody uh, schedule. I, I do go where my scheduler tells me. If she says, hey, we can do your surgery in a month without the robot or in three months with the robot, most people are going to say, I don't want to wait that long. It's not that much of a difference. But um, in some practices, there will be more of a wait. Um, if the surgeon says, boy, I really want you to be my, robot, my robotic patient, for the spaces I have available, then I would definitely not turn them down. They want they want it to be safer. Um, so I do about half my cases robotically in the hospital. Probably half, probably two thirds. Um, it is a little slower. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna. There's a million things I can say about it. If we were on the phone, it would be a half an hour. Uh, I want to refer you back to the article. I want to basically use this talk to make you not get too hung up on, I've got to have robotic or I can't have robot. There's a lot of stuff on the internet where people have opinions. And I think sometimes what they take is what happened to me is what everybody should do. And what I really think is what happened to me as an individual, whether we're talking about uh, laparoscopic, sleeve, foregut, hernia stuff, everybody should know about it. People should tell their stories. I really believe in social media, but the same way you wouldn't tell other people to raise their kids exactly the way you raise your kids if you're a parent. Uh, every kid is different. Every parent's different. So you can say what worked in your situation. And so that's, I think that's where we cross the line of, I did this, so everybody has to do it. So um, that's, that's what gets confusing when you read online. Also, a lot of surgeons have um, fairly strong opinions, but I, I'd say most of us are on the, on the line of this. When you actually talk about to the surgeon, one of the great things about the robot, too, if I schedule a case robotically, I don't have to use the robot for the whole case. I can still go laparoscopic for parts of the case if I need to. And we always start laparoscopically putting the ports in and getting the robot docked. So it really gives me 
both the tools in my toolbox where if I start in a day in a laparoscopic room, we're not going to bring the robot in if I suddenly find a problem. Now, that doesn't usually happen. But for a more complicated case, that's where I, I like booking them robotically, too. Um, again, so talk to your surgeon directly about this. Don't let anybody, don't worry about making this decision before you talk to the surgeon. Uh, and, and if you're easy and they want to do it robotically, that's fine. If you're super hard and they really want to do it robotically, I would definitely tend to say, yes, let's let you do. I don't want to take away any tools from your toolbox, doctor. Um, so that recommendation, again, don't be afraid of getting a second opinion. If for some reason you don't have chemistry or you just want to do your homework, uh, a direct second opinion with another surgeon is really the only way to do your full research. Everything else is just sort of background. Um, I did throw in a little tagline here of do they do Sadie. That is my personal opinion. It actually makes more of a difference what operation we do in 2022 than exactly how we do it. Uh, you know, what tools, what tools it took to build your house. It's more important to have uh, the right house to live in. And I think um, a lot of practices are still migrating to Sadie. They don't feel comfortable yet, or they um, are biased against it. And I think um, that's an even bigger question of do you offer Sadie versus gastric bypass. So that's just my two cents extra. Uh, I do love the robot for Sadie. I do them laparoscopically too. Um, and that's a conversion issue. I think a lot of people will have this robotic question. If you're converting from a sleeve, really you don't need to worry about the robot for most things. If you're converting from a band, uh, I do see some advantages. I do it both ways. Uh, if you're converting from gastric bypass or having a major revision on gastric bypass, I think that's one place where there's a very good question for, for robotics. Uh, so anyhow, let's see. What else? Anybody I need to give a shout out to? Thank you so much to Obesity Action Coalition. Uh, thank you to all my mentors. And I always like to thank my teachers. Uh, and I have teachers older and younger. Um, and we're always continuing to learn. Um, I hope this is helpful as part of your uh, part of your perspective on, on your health and your safety and, and know that everybody cares. Everybody is out there doing their best. We have various uh, factors that, we, that make it complicated, um, but uh, don't, don't be overwhelmed. As I always say, especially with weight loss surgery, for the, for the patient who's a good candidate for weight loss surgery, the worst thing we can do is scare you and do nothing. So uh, don't, don't be scared away by all these all these uh, decisions or factors, most of them are, are going to be pretty obvious uh, when you actually sit down and talk to the surgeon and say, I'd like to do it the way you normally do it. I, as a patient myself, the last thing I want to be is a VIP. I want people to do operations on me the same way they do on everybody else because they honestly do their best on the average person. Doing better than our best, we actually tend to <laughs> sometimes do unnecessary things or extra things that are not proven or not standard, and that's not usually a good way to go. So don't be afraid to be a standard issue patient. Even if you have special needs, uh, uh, you don't have to be a VIP. Uh, thanks so much. I hope everybody uh, uh, gets good benefit out of this, and it's a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, Dr. Bedlin, for providing us with such helpful information on what robotic surgery is and how to know if you should talk to your doctor about getting it. The OEC has a variety of educational opportunities for you throughout the year, but one of the best places you can turn to for a quality, unbiased education is our resource library. Simply visit obesityaction.org library and check out our brochures, articles, guides, videos, and more health talks. Also be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified of any future educational events and broadcasts. Thanks for joining us.